Hello, my name's Kylie Baker and I think it's time to tell you a little bit more about ultrasound during cardiopulmonary arrest. It might be hard for some of you to picture but it is on the way in. Now when you first start uh, you really have to think where is this person going to stand? I mean around a cardiac arrest it really is prime real estate. The most important people I think are the airway folk who have to have right of way and then the CPR folk usually who, who um, alternate from side to side and whoever's not doing CPR will often have the jobs of cannula and drugs. Now it doesn't leave much more space for the um, ultrasound person and since sonographers generally right-handed most of us prefer to stand about here opposite the patient's right hip. Uh, of course we're uh, fighting for pole position with the folk administering the drugs and the defibrillator has to fit somewhere around here. But usually we have a reach up into their patient's epigastrium with a probe like this. Don't forget however there are many other leads and cords around the patient so it can be very hard to get a window. Now it is possible, in fact I think it's preferable to start looking at the heart before CPR stops. This way you get some idea of whether you're going to get a good picture or not. And even though CPR is continuing, there's already two things we can tell about this heart from underneath. We can say that there does not appear to be a big pericardial effusion. And secondly, that the right ventricle does not appear bigger than the left ventricle implying that severe right heart strain is quite unlikely. Now if we're using coached, which is currently a good idea, you have to wonder where ultrasound is going to fit into this pattern. And frankly, if we stick with this pattern, I think that the point of care ultrasound is going to have to be right underneath with the pulse check, simultaneous with the pulse check after the um, shock has been disarmed. This will only happen if you don't see a shockable rhythm on the, um, on the tracing. Now, I do have a little bit of concern about this and there is a, uh, um, at least one paper recommending that ultrasound comes up here during the evaluation of the ECG. Of course this means that the person who is doing the defibrillation has to watch out for the sonographer and make sure they have their hands off the patient before the discharge. This system is called Coach Red with the record between the H and the E. Now I'm not necessarily saying this is what we should be do, but there is one situation where I think it could be important. But again, what we must stress right from the beginning is that point of care ultrasound should not increase the time off the chest. The best sonographers will be there for five seconds and out again. They will record a clip and then they will examine the clip more closely um, afterwards. Now here's the one thing that makes me wonder if we should be moving ultrasound a little bit earlier. As you can see, we can see a fibrillating heart, VF. Now, Using coached, this would mean we probably wouldn't bother doing an ultrasound at this point in time because defibrillation will mandate a shock. But what would happen, for example, if this VF was so fine that it barely records on your ECG or you forget to turn up the gain on the ECG? You might miss a shockable rhythm. However, you can also argue that um, a fine VF might benefit more from CPR than a shock anyway. If, for example, we see this, and you'll notice that this is a clip, this is obvious asystole. There's no effusion, there's no big right heart. This is something that requires ongoing CPR and adrenaline. If, on the other hand, we see something like this, a very rapidly beating heart but with no obvious squeeze, you'd be concerned about doing defibrillation or possibly a synchronized shock depending on whether there's a palpable pulse or not. If you saw this one during CPR well we actually have a big 
intraatrial clot in the left atrium here. This is a post-mortem clot. I think what this means is that um, further CPR is unlikely to be effective. Now finally, the one you've all been waiting for, the one that we hear about ultrasound for, is the pericardial tamponade. And you'll notice here we have large clot surrounding a beating heart. But the most important thing about this beating heart is that the right ventricle is squashed flat. It's not able to take any volume in. That is what tells you that this really needs to be evacuated. And in this case, because the pericardial fluid is mottledy grey, likely to be thick and cellular, we're going to need a very large uh, bore and long needle. You'll see that it's nearly 10 centimetres deep. But you know, there's a lot more we can do with the ultrasound, and as our repertoires increase, we'll be able to help you with a lot more than just pericardial tamponade. Let's have a look at the 4Hs and the 4Ts. In fact, point of care ultrasound can help you with at least half of these and get your head start on number five. What are we talking about? Let me show you. Obviously, the hyper and hypothermia is something you'll probably pick up simply by touching the patient. The hyper and hypokalemia, hypoglycemia, is something we hope will come on the VBG. I certainly haven't managed to see those on the ultrasound yet. And finally, toxins are th something that we pick up from history and examination of the patient and examination of the room. But in the middle, I can easily find for you hypovolemia and even find you some of the sources of blood loss. I can find tamponade, I can find tension pneumothorax, and I can find thromboembolism. And in fact, if you have a hypoxic patient, that other H, I can get a very good look at the lungs and tell you if there's consolidation, fluid, or congestive cardiac failure. This is what I mean. Here's another subcostal heart during an arrest. Obviously, haven't finished um, resuscitating yet, and we can see that the right ventricle is very big. That's the right ventricle there. It's so big it's pushing the interventricular septum into the left. That's the left ventricle there. Now while the patient has no pulse, the big right ventricle may simply be an effect of the back pressure of the, um, from the lungs. But if we move a little bit further, we get a return of spontaneous circulation. And that right ventricle remains big with the interventricular septum ducking down, then this is high evidence likely of a PE. I think the thing that's easier to say is that lack of a large right ventricle is evidence against a PE. That's where I would use it. Now it is possible in fact to look for sources of the PE. This is a clot on a pick line, but frankly it's a bit of a business and it's not something I usually have time for during an arrest. There are far more important things to do than go searching for DVTs. Now I don't advise you to go looking for regional wall motion abnormalities. But as we get bigger, or as artificial intelligence gets cleverer, our ultrasound machines might be finding these for themselves. In this picture, we're looking down the barrel of the right ventricle, of the left ventricle, down here, and you can see on our left, it's almost winking at us. That's normally functioning ventricular contraction. On our right, the rest of that circle is simply watching not contracting at all. That's a regional wall motion abnormality. It's a major left L LAD uh, defect in this one. Now, pneumothorax is something where we can help. In fact, we can even look at the lungs during CPR, as you can see. The long dark shadows stretching down the screen are our rib shadows and the bright white horizontal line between the rib shadows is the lung. Now if you can see these vertical bright uh, laser beams, rockets, comets they've been called, coming down from the pleural line, we can say quite happily that there is no pneumothorax at this point. These vertical bee lines, rockets or comets 
confirm that we must have lung tissue right up against the chest wall, just here. Now if we don't have these um, B lines, we have to wait until a pause. During a pause, here's a rib, here's the pleura, we focus again on that pleural line and if it has extra twinkling or sparkling scintillation, we call it sliding marching ants, we can say that there is no pneumothorax at this point where I've got the probe. Contrast it with this one over here, rib, rib, pleura. See how this pleura is absolutely dead. There's no more life or slide or sparkle in it than a little bit of muscle above and then the flexion below. It's this pleural line here and here, five millimeters below the rib, where we focus our attention. Now, it is quite possible to look in the abdomen for free fluid or blood during CPR. We look at the right upper quadrant and see if there's any blood here. And we can look at the left upper quadrant to see if there's any blood at the lower pole of the spleen. We can look at the bladder, behind the bladder. This is actually very important because uh, ruptured ectopic is one of the more common causes of collapse in young women. And we can even look at the lung bases. We're looking here for um, hemothorax. Not all that common, perhaps, except in trauma or ruptured thoracic aneurysms. The triangle is where we expect to see fluid. But that lessens for another day. And you know, there's even more. Uh, this is uh, not yet ready for mainstream television. But it is actually possible to see through into the blood vessels of the brain. This is a middle cerebral artery here on the left-hand side of the picture. And if we drop a Doppler measurement down through a blood vessel, we can look at the waveform of blood flow in the brain, major in the MCA. And what this tells us in this particular picture is that there's good diastolic flow in this portion of the brain, meaning it's unlikely that we've got raised intracerebral pressure just here. Now this is all very uh, sci-fi and fancy, but at the rate that ultrasound machines are developing, very soon I think the robot will take over from us. So in summary, I think the most important thing to know from the beginning is that point-of-care ultrasound should not increase the time off the chest. It's hard to work your way in and around, but it's a matter of getting ready, getting ready to save your clip, saving the clip and then moving offline to review it. With the help of the ultrasound, we can nail one, of the half, one and a half of those H's and at least three of the T's. The good thing about point of care ultrasound is that we can repeat it. We can actually see how our resuscitation is improving or not. And finally, even more important, is that we can record our findings. Now what this means is that we can audit our findings and we can learn from them. And this is the way that we're going to improve our CPR.